Hello. You're listening to One Voice Makes a Difference, a place where people can tell their stories of how God's voice made a difference in their life. We pray you will be inspired and encouraged by today's episode. Now, here's your host, Janet Swanson. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to One Voice Makes a Difference podcast. I have a special guest with us today. I am so inspired by this lady, but not just inspired. I feel something stirring inside of my heart for revival for it's like just a few months ago, I heard the Lord say, I'm going to fan the flame And God has placed a flame in each and every one of us. And now I feel like the wind of the spirit is blowing upon our hearts and he is fanning the flame. So I want to introduce you to this mighty, powerful woman of God. Her name is Dr. Jamie Morgan, and she's an ordained minister who has been in ministry for decades as a senior pastor. She's a teacher of the word. She's an evangelist. She is a revivalist, a reformer, a prophetic voice, a conference speaker, a podcaster, a TV show host, an author, and a mentor. She has published four books, and her most recent, Thirsty, is a 31-day journey to personal revival. And I personally cannot wait to get that book myself and read it. She also writes for Charisma and other publications around the world. Her podcast, Firestarter, on the Charisma Podcast Network is rated in the top 1% of podcasts globally. And she is a member of America's National Prayer Committee and the Assemblies of God Prayer committee. She's also the founder of Trailblazer Mentoring Network, and I'm going to have her to talk about that and in accessory ministry. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes too, but welcome Dr. Jamie Morgan. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, Janet, thank you so much for asking me and what an honor it is to be a guest on your podcast and be able to interact and share my heart with your listening audience. Your listening audience is blessed. Mm. And by the way, if you have not su- subscribed or and reviewed and given Janet's podcast a five-star rating, <laughs> go ahead and do that because I'm telling you right now, Aww. you need Janet to intentionally, consistently speak into your life. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And your voice, you know, the the podcast is called One Voice Makes a Difference. And your voice is making a difference in so many people's lives, but has impacted my life. And in a time when I was really needing um, the Holy Spirit just to stir inside of me and comfort me, I started listening to your podcast and I was so encouraged. So I am like just so inspired by you and, and I'm just so grateful to have you on here. I know that you have a word for our listeners today, but first I want to ask you, how did you get the name Firestarter for your podcast? Well, it's interesting because when God instructed me to raise up a podcast, uh, I thought, what direction do I go in? Do I go in the direction of women in ministry? Do I go in the direction of pastoral ministry? Do I, do, I, was, I was being encouraged to make it as general as possible so I could cover whatever topic I wanted to at any given time. And just see, I started making a list, mm-hmm. a list of all the different options to name the podcast. And one day God dropped in my spirit, Firestarter. Yeah. And then he said, I want you to narrow the focus of your podcast and the, the, the premise of your podcast be this, to create a desperation for revival in the hearts of God's people. And mm-hmm. he said, that is to be your focus. So truly the Lord dropped it in my spirit and gave me this specific focus, even though I was being challenged to make it to, to broaden 
the mm-hmm. focus and make it very general. The Lord said, nope, this, has, this podcast has a very specific assignment to create that desperation for revival. And, you know, when I listen to your podcast, one of the things that you've been saying lately is go ahead and say it. I am a revivalist. (laughs) (laughs) So what is revival and how do you become a revivalist? Wow. Well, you know, revival is to live again. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, what is the difference between revival and awakening? Mm -hmm. So revival. Bible is when, when someone has been on fire and they've lost their fire and to, to get on fire again, to yeah. live again. Uh, maybe they were at one time on fire, but they're maybe now lukewarm. Right. And so to, to, to get revived, revival is to go from that lukewarm status to that on fire for God status. Awakening is for the lost. Mm. So, so, so like if God, uh, we, we need both revival and awakening in, right. in our nation, as well as every nation of the world. But I pray for revival for the churches of, uh, this nation as, and the pastors and the Christians. And then I pray for awakening, mm. uh, for the lost in, in our nation wow. that they would wake up to their need for Jesus yes. to, to their need to follow him. Oh, that is so powerful. So how can we become a revivalist then? So if revival is to come alive, what is a revivalist? So a revivalist is someone that that e- either is contending for revival mm-hmm. or when revival hits a church, a region, a state, a nation, that uh, they will help to facilitate that revival. They will help to uh, encourage the revival because with revival comes, you know, one of my mentors has has this expression, you know, a true revival when here come the critics. Yeah. And so there's always the, so oh oh yeah stay in revival yeah, you, you, you know it's a, you know it's a true revival when the critics come out of the woodwork. Oh, wow. Every true revival has had critics come out of the uh, come out of the woodwork. Um, wow. And uh, a, a revivalist is someone that they themselves have been personally revived, and now they're either contending for revival or they are helping to facilitate pastor, encourage the revival that has already been sent. So revival is really more than, than just coming to church and coming to a three-day meeting or a two-day meeting, whatever. We just had revival in our church. We had Tony Suarez here and his wife, Jean, and it was amazing. And I could feel something coming alive again, you know, since the pandemic, this was our first revival. Um, I could feel the Holy spirit really working on people's hearts and people were really more, more open. I believe in our revival that we had, there was an awakening and a revival. So revival is, is more than just coming to church. We saw that there's been revivals that throughout history, throughout a hundred years, we saw the Brownsville Brownsville revival. How, how do we keep revival? Because, you know, sometimes you see revivals come and they go and you're like, what happened to Brownsville? What happened? How do you keep it alive? Yeah, that is such a good question. And it's a question every revivalist, every pastor asks uh, uh, when revival visits their church and you have to create an atmosphere Mm. You know, I am a pastor of a church. It is my responsibility to create an atmosphere in my church, in my services Mm -hmm. for the Holy Spirit to move, Mm -hmm. but also not just visit, but to abide, to stay. And so when I first became a pastor, it was interesting because Mm -hmm. uh, it was 15 years ago and the, uh, I'll call it the seeker friendly movement was, was, (laughs) was being, was very encouraged um, among churches. I mean, there were conferences on how to have a seeker friendly church and this and that. And the Lord really, really, as a, as a new pastor, the Lord really um, encountered me that the every church is to, uh, to, to create an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit 
<laughs> feels comfortable, Amen. not, not the person sitting in the pew, you know? Right, right, and so, right. yes, you know, we want, we want, we want to be hospitable. And, you know, right. if you're going to have a coffee bar in the lobby, have your coffee bar, whatever you're going to do. But at the same time, uh, we're not there uh, to make somebody feel good and then walk out in uh, unchanged or right. walk out with uh, coffee breath and not having touched, not having had the Holy Spirit touch them. We are there to, to create this atmosphere where the Holy Spirit feels welcome to move and not just move, to stay. stay. So what happens in revivals, to answer your question, Janet, is the revival, let's say, will hit a church. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit just falls. Yeah. Whether it's called, whether it's the rain of the spirit or the, the fire of the spirit at some point in some service, like you had mentioned Brownsville, it was Father's Day weekend and it was Steve Hill. And he was, he was a missionary just itinerary from church to church and preaching right. a Father's Day sermon. And all of a sudden, bam, the right. fire of the Holy Spirit hit that service. Yeah. What happens historically yeah. is that um, it almost becomes... Um, if it's not fostered and encouraged and protected, mm. uh, it becomes almost, you, you have to understand at any given time, we can shift from relationship to religion. Yes. So it can become a situation where either the uh, fire of God is not stewarded properly or flesh can get in the way. Yeah. And, and oftentimes that is what happens mm -hmm. uh, in, you hear different ministers talking about when revival hit their church that um, uh, they, they had services seven days a week. Yeah. And then they were exhausted. Exhausted. Yes. Yes. And, and the more, you know, tired you get, the more tendency there is to get in the flesh. And then you have, and then on, in addition to that, it's a spiritual warfare and you're always fighting off demons and television cameras are coming to your church and they're trying to out you and they're trying to say what a fraud you are. Yeah. You're fighting with all of these spiritual spirit, demonic spirits, as well as mm -hmm. uh, in the natural people just being critics mm -hmm. and uh, oftentimes flesh will get in the way. I mean, that's not every time, but um, if you study revivals, I, I, when I got my master's degree and my doctorate for eight years, I studied historic revivals. And oftentimes that is a, the flesh getting in the way is a catalyst for the revival to end. Wow. Yeah. I think that's the number one thing in anything in our life. Our flesh gets in the way and we want to have our way, or we could be just like Moses. God, this is the way you did it before and you know you spoke to the rock the rock and now you struck the rock and god said strike it don't speak to it or speak to it don't strike it then we're like well, well this is the way we did it before so we need to do this song again and do it five times until the holy spirit moves because i'm a worship pastor and i've been you know i'm like no the holy spirit is not going to move on the modulation of the key chain you know <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, please teach that to all worship pastors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it's just this, I mean, there are churches that the worship pastor will go on some website to see which worship songs are trending. Mm. And that's what they sing on a Sunday morning. Cause they know that's what the people want to hear. That's what the people are listening to on the radio. Those are the popular worship songs. It is nothing at all wrong with, with doing a popular worship song. What is wrong is if we're choosing worship songs based on popularity and not on Holy Spirit. Yes. What would you have? What are you anointing for this season? That's it. Uh, yeah. And, and sometimes it's taking an old song and bringing it back. And sometimes it is a brand new song that's that's exactly. that's on that that's trending. But mm -hmm. it's the Holy Spirit. It's what the Holy Spirit. It's it's what the Holy Spirit Spirit is hovering over. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. That's exactly what I do. I pray about the music. I pray about the songs. God, what's going to ignite something in us? What do you want to hear? 
this is all about you anyway, Lord. <laughs> and I have people writing me letters requesting, I want you to sing this. I want you to do this. I just throw it in the trash. I don't even listen to it because. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Janet. Because that's exactly what you need to do with them. It's no different than somebody come on, coming up to me and saying, uh, Pastor Jamie, you know, I'd really like you in next Sunday to teach on the book of, or preach on the book of Revelation. Well, my response is always, if the Lord shows me to do that, I'll do that. But I'm not going to take my direction from you. <laughs> and I tell them, I won't let the people in my church yeah. tell the worship leader mm -hmm. what to play. Right. You know, this one likes hymns and this one likes the popular and this one likes this worship team band and this one. And it's none of it. It's all go before the Lord. And, and you are right on, Janet. Because when that's the only way that worship can become prophetic. And it's speaking to people's lives and where God gets the glory. And that's our goal. And I pray that that will be the goal over your life, everywhere that you go, God, I want you to get the glory in my life. I want to usher in the presence of God in my life, because, you know, the word says that God has plans for each and every person on this earth. He has designs over your life. And I love what what um, Dr. Morgan said, she says that the Holy Spirit doesn't come by just for visitations. He's come to stay. He's come here. He wants to rest upon us. And he, in the designs that he has over our lives, he wants to pull those things out and he wants to be the leader of it. He wants us to tune our ear into the perfect pitch of the Holy Spirit to match the tone and then bring that to the throne room and bring it to the body of Christ. And that's where lives are changed. And I believe that's where revival can flow from, you know, from our hearts and from our church. We can be carriers of the revival, can we? Oh, absolutely. We can. And uh, uh, when in studying historic revivals, whether it be Azusa Street, Brownsville, Hebrides Revival, the Welsh Revival, you name it. Oh, it only took one person, sometimes maybe two or three, but that one person to contend for revival and then help steward that revival. I'm telling you, if you're that one, for every person listening to this podcast, you be that one. Amen. You don't have to wait for the sleepy church to wake up in order for you to experience revival. Mm -hmm. You can have personal revival. So, you, you know, we can be, oh, my church is so lukewarm. My church is dead. We can go around saying it all day long. Mm -hmm. But you be that catalyst. Yeah. You be the one that's on fire and then be the brush fire that sets everything you touch mm -hmm. on fire for God. And so, you know, a corporate revival, you know, God sends it. He, he, it's all Holy Spirit driven. The Holy Spirit yeah. sends it where and when and how he mm -hmm. wants to. Mm -hmm. But personal revival we are as close to God as we want to be. Mm. The scriptures say, draw near to God. And what happens? He will draw near to you. Mm. So it is my personal decision how close to God I want to be. So Janet, the closer I draw to the all-consuming fire, mm. the more on fire I am. Wow. Even if everybody around me isn't on fire. Mm. Even if, if my, maybe my pastor isn't and the people in my church aren't and the, my, my, my denomination isn't, I don't care where you are or where, what church you go to, you be the one that's on fire. Amen. And you can be that difference maker everywhere. Yes. Go. And people are like, I don't know what it is that you got, but I want it. Amen. And that's our prayer. I'm just praying that as each and every person is listening to this podcast, that they will feel the presence of God and feel the fire and the power of God coming upon their lives and that God wants to do a new thing inside of them. And you can experience that personal revival. So how would you say, okay, we draw near to God. So what, what else to experience this personal revival? I would say most definitely a heart of repentance. Mm -hmm. It's got to begin with the repentant heart. And, you know, Janet, every single day when I sit at the feet of Jesus, first thing in the morning, uh, I will say to him, Lord, here's my heart. Here's my heart. Mm -hmm. I ask you to speak to it. I ask you to convict it. I ask 
you to heal it. I ask you to soften it. Yes. Yeah, uh, listen, in 24 hours, Janet, we can get hardness of heart over something. That's right. That's you right. You know, uh, Lord, do I have it? Does my heart have a, un, any unforgiveness? There's, is there resentment building up? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then the last thing I say, I, I say, Lord, give me your heart. Mm-hmm. And I say, Show me the true condition of my heart, because the, the scriptures tell us that our we our heart we can be deceived as to what our true spiritual heart condition is. Uh, we don't know somebody else's heart, let alone our own. And so right. every single day, I don't want to be deceived into thinking I'm fine, I'm good, thank you. Oh, well, my heart's good. Oh, my Christian walk is fine. I want to know what my the true condition of my heart is. And then when the Lord shows me, yeah, mm -mm, you need to repent of that. Mm, You need to release that person from uh, the the, the hurt that they caused you and the unforgiveness you're holding. Mm, You need to release that. Then in a spirit of repentance, I'll say, oh Lord, I turn away from that. Mm-hmm. I turn it. They, that person doesn't owe me anything, not even an I'm sorry. And I lay down that sin or that compromise or that worldliness. Bottom line is we're never going to have full personal revival if we have sin, habitual sin in our lives. Mm-hmm. If we have hardness of heart, if we're carrying around unforgiveness. So just making sure we have that. Again, none of us are perfect. Right. I'm not trying to paint this picture that you have to live this perfect Christian walk in order to experience personal Mm -hmm. revival. But you've got to have the heart attitude that I want to be right before the Lord. And the minute Mm -hmm. I do sin, the minute I do, you know what? I think I have unforgiveness. I repent immediately. It's that, Mm -hmm. it's that being quick to repent, quick to forgive and quick to obey. Wow. I love that. I love that. And all of that involves crucifying this flesh of ours. <laughs> oh, does it ever? Oh my gosh. Because when you, when you um, wake up, you wake up with flesh. So when you go into your prayer, I love doing my prayer time in the morning because I can take it all to the Lord and come before him and pray those kind of prayers and crucify this flesh of mine, because my flesh is my flesh and it wants what it wants. Right. It surely does. And you know what? The Lord will even use situations. I'll give you an example. Okay. I had a really hurtful betrayal happen to me a few years ago. Mm. It was really hurtful. I was going through with just a, I was hurting. Mm. And uh, I remember calling a, a friend of mine and he, and to, for prayer, for the healing of my heart. Mm. And he said to me, this is what he said to me. He said, Jamie, he said, what is God trying to crucify in you? He said, I realize that this has been, this has been the most, this is, this this is hurtful and there's no getting around it, but what work is the refiner's fire trying to do in your life using (laughs) this thing that just happened to you? And I'm like, hello. I I didn't say this to him, but I felt like I'm thinking I'm calling you for healing of my heart, not to (laughs) tell me I need to crucify my flesh. And so (laughs) And so anyway, he said, and I, and he said to me, he said, uh, I said, I don't know. I don't know what area God's crucifying in me. And he said, let me ask you a question. He said, of all the pain that you just went through in this situation, what was the most painful moment? And, and, and immediately it came to me. It was a moment. It was a moment when I was, when the person falsely accused me in front of my leadership Mm -hmm. uh, in my denomination. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he said, "Mm, there it is. He he said, there it is. He said, you, you, the Lord is trying to crucify within you, the fear of man, because for the next season that he's taking you to, you can't, you can't carry any fear of man into that next, next season of destiny with you. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, your reputation, you, you've worked very hard at having a stellar reputation, which I do. I mean, a, the book of Proverbs says mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that we need to have a good reputation. It's like silver and gold. Mm-hmm. But he said, Jamie, remember, Jesus was of no reputation. Mm-hmm. And he said, he said, you're, you just, you, you way too concerned mm-hmm. what people are thinking of you. And he said, you, you need, you need to crucify that the fear of man and, and you need to crucify your flesh in regard to the fear of man. Mm, wow. Anyway. So he'll, so the point is the Lord will even use these hurtful situations in our lives and say, okay, 
let's, you know, I didn't create this. I didn't send this, but you know, I'm, I'm so good. The Lord is so good that he will use this. He will turn it around what the enemy meant for evil for our good. Yeah, and anyway, yeah. that was an example in my life of, yeah. of the Lord. I, you know, I'm, I'm known as a very bold person. I don't mince words. I say things the way they are. So I honestly didn't think I had any fear of man in me. Wow. And the Lord used my pastor friend to say, mm, yeah, thank, you do. Thank, thank you. you do. Wow. Yeah. Well, even before we started with the recording, the podcast today, we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, women in ministry and, And here lately, I've been having some, uh, some people to speak some very, very negative, hard words in my life. And then the next day you'll have people speaking great things in your life. And it could be like a bipolar day, you know, (laughs) like, oh my God. And it can come from the same person (laughs) in the morning. They're encouraging you by nightfall. They don't like you anymore. (laughs) So we were, we're, you know, we've been moving and moving our furniture and so forth. And I, I didn't tell any of my family about the comments that were made on Facebook and how the people, some people were bashing me on Facebook. And um, cause I, I was talking about something very controversial and um, the, the, the title was very controversial. And then, and then all of a sudden I just stopped in the middle of moving and I said, do y'all know that I was called the scum of the earth today and Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> They're like, what? Where Welcome to the ministry, from? Janet. Welcome to I the know. ministry. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, maybe you just said a few minutes ago when those critics come in, you know that revival is starting because you're not doing and saying things that itch the ears and please the ears, but you're saying things to challenge people to think differently and to reach the lost. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to reach the lost. And I know that you have a passion to reach the lost. Also, I want to ask you a very personal question. Mm -hmm. What is your story? Oh, yeah. I love talking about my story. I was, uh, I was saved at 26. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. uh, And I was a raging by the by the age of 26. I was a raging alcoholic. And I was agoraphobic because I was so riddled with fear, anxiety attacks and panic attacks, I couldn't leave my home. Mm. And, uh, but at, at, at 26 years old, it was December 26, 1989. I went into the, my bedroom and I said, I can't do this anymore. And I cried out to God. Now I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing about his word. Uh, the only thing I knew about God, I didn't even know the basic Bible stories. Wow. Like Adam and Eve and Noah, the ark. I thought David and Goliath was about a boy and his dog. You know, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I and I said, God, I don't know you. I know nothing about you. All I really believe about you is that A, you're real and B, that you created me. Thank yeah. God the two things I believed about God were true. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I said, th- this, the way I'm living my life, it's not working. And I said, your plan, you, because you created me, I like I a plus B equals C God created me. Then he has a plan. Then his plan is the best. And I said, because you created me, your plan has got to be better than this. Yeah. And, uh, he, in that moment, Janet, he revealed Jesus to me mm. that Jesus is Lord and savior and that he wanted to be uh, my Lord and Savior. So anyway, uh, I said, Lord, I'll go wherever you tell me to go. I'll say what you tell me to say. I'll do what you tell me to do. My life is yours. And I ended with this. If you can take this, if you, if you, if you will take this messed up girl yeah. and do anything with her life, I'll do, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Cause in my mind, I didn't know God then I thought I was unredeemable. I thought I'm too, I'm too far gone. I'm too messed up. There's yeah. no way that God can do it. And you know what he, he did, I got up off my knees and shackles just fell off of me. I could feel the shackles of fear and anxiety and, you know, depression and alcohol and nicotine addiction and you name it. I had it anyway. So I just began serving in the local church, but knew Janet couldn't articulate it, but I knew that there was a call of God in my life. I wouldn't be able to say that back then, but right. I knew God wouldn't use me in big ways. Yeah. I just began serving. I began serving. And there was a, a prophet that came, someone that moved in the prophetic came to a women's retreat. Mm. And she calls me out of the audience mm-hmm. and she says, you up here. And I'm like, me? Yeah. So I go up and she says, you're called to the ministry. You're called to be a pastor. 
Mm. And I'm like, I am. And so I, I go, I leave, I leave the retreat and, you know, any prophetic word that I receive, uh, you know, pastors don't just pastor the people, they pastor their gifts. Mm. So I thought I need to submit this to my pastor. Mm. And I did. I made an appointment Monday morning, submitted to the pastor. And I said, pastor, um, and I told him what happened at the retreat. And he, he's shaking his head. No, no, no. The whole time he's going, no. He said, women aren't called to the ministry. Women are, women stay home with the children. Women, you know, start, you know, all that and the blah, blah, blah. And I, I held back the tears. Cause I was so here I was on cloud nine, you know, I was so excited coming home from the retreat yeah. thinking I would get encouraged when I met with my pastor and he did nothing but discourage me and told me that that's why that our church only has male board members because women are called to any form of preaching, teaching leadership. And I, I went out into the car, Janet, and I, I burst out into tears, just me and the Lord. And I said, God, deliver me deliver me from this church. And the Lord made it very clear to me that there were lessons I needed to learn there. And that is where I belonged. And this is what the Lord said. He said to me, he said, the very people, and if, listen, if there's a woman that's listening, listen, uh, that, that feels a call to the ministry, listen to this. The Lord said to me, the very people that you think will be an obstacle to your call will be the very ones that will launch you. Mm. Now I had a decision to make in that moment, Janet. Was I going to believe God? Was I going to trust him? Was I, or was I going to leave that church and make, try to make it happen in the flesh? Yeah. Oh, how many people do we know that have done that? Yeah. Try to make their call happen in the flesh. Oh, please don't do that. No. You, you, wherever God plants you, wherever he wants you to be, you'll bloom there. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the very th- that very thing happened. My pastor became... Uh, over kind of an overseer over like 25 churches in our, in our, in our region. And one of them needed a pastor and he asked me to be the interim pastor. And he made me sign papers saying, I know I can never be the senior pastor. I know I'm signing. Okay. I'll sign away. Blah, blah, blah. You know? And then six months later, the, the congregation came to him and said, she, we want her as our permanent pastor. And by that time, God had changed his heart. Wow. And the very one that I thought would be the obstacle mm. to launching into the ministry was the very one that launched me. Oh, wow. That yeah. is so powerful. So I got in the ministry and here I am, I'm now a pastor and I'm, you know, and I thought, oh, everybody's going to be happy about it. Right. I'm happy. Right. Everybody is going to be happy. Oh, not so much. <laughs> so, wow. so then here come the critics. Here come the critics. And in the beginning, it would really bother me. They would hurl, they get it. They hurl two stones at us. If you're a woman in ministry, you know, this first Timothy two and first Corinthians 14, they, 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 they try to stone us with those two scriptures, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and they, they, they're like the theologians, you yeah. know, that <laughs> they know exactly what they're talking about, but to only, uh, to only view Mm-hmm. The, 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 the theology of women in ministry from just two, two verses in the Bible right. is like going to Disney world and saying you're an expert in all things, Disney world, but you've only visited the hot dog stand and stroller rental. Right, right, right. No, 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 no. And th- those were th- first Corinthians two and excuse me, first Corinthians 14 and first Timothy two, they were. They were, they were, they were specific situations that mm-hmm. Paul was dealing with. So it would be like me as a pastor, if I'm correcting, let's say it was a, there was a group of teenagers and they were chewing gum and sticking the gum underneath their, <laughs> underneath the pew. And I'm like, you need to stop that. You know, d- no chewing gum in church. Right. <laughs> you know, like right. I was, I'm correcting that group of teenagers over what they were doing and then making a doctrine Wow. Out of no gum in church. Yeah. Or teenagers can't, Do you that. know, whatever, yeah. can't, whatever, you know, listen, listen, if I was the devil, okay. L- listen to me. Mm. 50% of the church is it, it's not, it's, I, I, let me back up. Most people will say 50% of the church are women. It's two thirds, mm. two thirds of the church, capital mm. C are women. Okay. 
if I was the devil, I would create a doctrine Mm -hmm. that said women can't preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. In doing so, they would that 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 doctrine of demons is what I call it. Yeah. Literally will put spiritual duct tape Mm -hmm. if it's believed over two thirds of the mouths of of people in in church, capital C, prohibiting them Mm. from lifting high the name of Jesus and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and let me add to that, the same churches that have these doctrines, they'll let women sing in the choir. (laughs) That's singing the gospel, right? Yeah. Even sing solo. I mean, you're a, you're a, you're a worship pastor, you know. So you know, sing, sing, singing a solo, you're singing the gospel. They will allow them to teach in Sunday school. They'll teach boys in Sunday school, little men in Sunday school. And oh, oh, here I go. They will send women overseas to be missionaries. What do missionaries do? They start churches to be eaten by lions. <laughs> I'm just saying, like at those same churches that have this doctrine of demons that women cannot preach the gospel will still, it, it's so, it, it, it's again, if I were the devil, wouldn't I want to shut the mouths of two thirds of the church? Oh my gosh. You know, that scripture was just used against me in December. And I was going to interview someone on my podcast, this lady who had actually been on the Oprah Winfrey show. I'm not going to speak any names, but she was on her show and she got born again. She used to be into new age and she was born again. And I thought, oh, wow, this would be great. I'm going to reach out to her. And she says, oh, yes, I'll be glad to to be on your podcast. If you would read um, First Timothy 12. <laughs> I'm like, OK, I was like, well, off the top of my head, I didn't know what it what that was. So I went back and I read it and I was devastated because this was coming from another woman, right? Can, can I t- can I tell you a secret? Yeah. Women are some of the harshest critics. <laughs> mm, no, no, no. I'm telling you, in over my decades of ministry, yes, of course, men, but the biggest critics and the most sometimes the most vicious critics have been women. Yeah, I I couldn't believe it, and I thought, gosh, Lord, you're the one that called me. Remember the dreams you gave me? Remember for a solid year that I didn't tell anybody the dreams you gave me? I had dreams. I had visions of preaching and teaching your word. And I would be on a stage and there'd be thousands of people around me. I would be preaching. I had those dreams and laying hands on people and they would be healed and deliverance ministry. I had all of those dreams and visions, but I kept it to myself because I had always been told, you know, or not really told to my face. You just knew it. If you were in the church, you look around, women do not preach at all. Like an unwritten, like an unwritten doctrine. Yes. yes. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I would remind the Lord that all the time. And, and I was like you, I went to a prayer conference and there was a Baptist minister, a minister that was there at our church of God prayer conference. This Baptist minister had been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was speaking over all of the pastors because it was actually it was a pastor's prayer conference. And so we all went to the altar and he pinpointed me out and he pointed his finger in my face. He said, thus saith the Lord, he is calling you to preach. The Lord says, how beautiful are the feet who carry the gospel. Well, that just was confirming that that scripture, I had been seeing it all over the place. People had been speaking it and just saying it out loud. How beautiful are the feet that carry the gospel. I was carrying the gospel in the nail salon. I was carrying it. Amen. Salon. I was carrying it everywhere else. And I, I, I had a pulpit at the salon because I did hair for 30 years. And, you know, I was already preaching to people there and didn't know it. Mm. And then he pinpointed me out and I looked at him and I said, no, he's, and he came back three times. He laid his hands on me and he said, I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord, you are called to preach and you mm. carry the gospel to the nations. And I fell out in the spirit for three hours. Oh my so goodness. 
saying all of that. And when this one woman said that one thing, that little bitty old thing, it, it hurt so bad that I felt like I had to give up the ministry. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 Gianna. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Listen, when, when I first went into the, I know you, you've been in the ministry for a while. It's like I have, but when I first went into the ministry, it really used to bother me. Like when that, what you just described happened, I was really bothered by it. I was so bothered by it that on our, our church website under like on the about me page where I had my picture and my, like my bio, I had linked an article about how it's God's will for women to preach. I mean, like, like wow. that I was on the offensive. I was trying to defend myself before anyone tried to accuse me. And after a while, you were that, again, that fear of man has got to go. It's got to go. Listen, we know that any amount of fear, if it's allowed to remain, will spread to other areas of life. But even with regard to women preaching the gospel, I knew, I knew that I had to just put, put like spiritual horse blinders on and say, Lord, you have called me, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's no person that can tell me otherwise. So now what I do is if someone comes to my church and what's interesting is I have a, (laughs) Jamie can be a man's name as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people will come to my church thinking it's pastor Jamie Morgan, a male pastor, assuming it's a male pastor. And they go, Oh, 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 you're the pastor. And if they want, if they want to have a genuine, like if they are receivable, and teachable. I will sit down with them and do a, do a Bible study about like what I had said earlier about, you know, the specific situations that Paul was addressing when he said women can't, can't teach. Um, but if they want to argue with me and most of them do, most of them don't, most of them aren't receivable or teachable. They just want to have an argument with you. This is what I say, you know what, sit down and you're going to argue with yourself and I'm going to go out and I'm going to win souls. Amen. While you're arguing this point yeah. about should women preach and teach, I'm going to go out and win souls. Mm. Well, when was the last soul that you won? Right. You know, and so, but, and you know, they don't want to say because, yeah. but anyway, um, you know, again, you have to have that discernment mm. to know when someone genuinely wants to know. Because some people come from those backgrounds. Yes. With those doctrines of demons yes. and they genuinely want to know the truth. And then you sit down and show them. But most of the time they just want to uh, argue. And the thing like with 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 the encounter with that lady that you had, Janet, if you can discount the messenger, you can discount the message. Mm. And see, it really wasn't you. It was it's the message. Right. It's again, you know, like when you write for charisma or I, I write an article for charisma. If they can underneath under the comment put, Oh, well, you shouldn't even be teaching. You shouldn't even be doing this because you're a woman. Whatever I said in the article in their mind is completely discounted because they've discounted the messenger. Wow. And again, it's the gospel that they're That's in. good. Yeah. That's it's good. They're, they're, they're trying to discount the gospel. And so I'm to the point in my ministry where it bothers me none. As a matter of fact, new levels, new devils. And the more I'm attacked, the more I realize, oh, wow, you know, I must be doing the Lord's using me and the enemy wants to discourage me and it's not going to happen. Right. So the Bible says, and Joel, he prophesied in the last days, I would pour my spirit out on men and women and their children and they will prophesy they'll have dreams and you know I just keep standing on that and I feel like even now that God is causing us to rise up even more so now than ever before listen Janet all hands are needed on deck in this hour. There is an urgency of the hour. Listen, those of you that are, that are listening to this podcast, if you don't see it, you're hiding under a rock somewhere. There is an urgency of the hour. We're in the last days for crying out loud. Come on, all hands, male and female. Yeah. All hands are needed on deck and no more mm-hmm. sitting on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. Listen, for every woman that's called to the ministry, if you're on the sidelines, I'm telling you right now, rise up out of your fear. Rise up mm-hmm. from the fear of man. Rise up from the traditions of man. Rise up from complacency. Jesus. Rise up from apathy. 
and and rise up. It's time. It no more, no more sitting on the bench. No more. It's you. All hands are needed in the army of God in this hour. And, and, and as long as you stay quiet, the enemy will have leverage over you. But the moment you start opening your mouth and making those declarations, no matter where you're at, because preaching the gospel, it, whether you're behind a pulpit, a pulpit or at Walmart in the bathroom, or you're in the checkout line, or you're at your job place, wherever it's at, or you're at the salon, wherever it is. You're, you're carrying the good news of the gospel and it's needed yes. and the enemy wants to shut us up because he wants to shut down revival. That's and it. He doesn't want to lose his grip on those souls. That's right. The moment we become carriers of the gospel and revival, it just, people will feel it when you walk by, you won't even have to say anything because you're confident that you're carrying this revival. You're carrying the Holy spirit, the power of the Holy spirit inside of you. And people are going to want it. They're not going to even, they're not going to care if you're a female or male, or even a child for that. People are so hungry right now that they are needing your voice and your voice can make a difference in this hour. Amen. And Dr. Jamie Morgan has a mentorship program. Can you tell us a little bit about Trailblazer Mentoring Network? Absolutely, Janet. Uh, The Lord for the past, oh my goodness, since 2015 has been speaking to me about raising up a mentoring movement for women called to the ministry, whether you, maybe you are sitting on the sidelines, but you need a mentor to help you find your purpose, to help you walk in your call, or you've been in the ministry for decades the, 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 the harsh reality, Janet, is most women called to ministry are not walking in their calling at all. That's true. And That's true. even those that are, are not walking in the fullness mm. of their call. They're, they're walking in a partial fulfillment. Mm. And so we need a mentor, another woman in the ministry to come alongside of us, to help us pull the gifts and talents out of us, to help us strategize, to help us to uh, even heal when we've been wounded yes, and to get off the injured players list and back into the harvest field. Yeah. Uh, we need someone to, to help us keep our golden sickle sharp and to stay combat ready, but to walk in the fullness yeah. of God's call on their life. So that when we come to the end of our lives and we're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, give an account for, did we reach every person right. that God's called us to reach? Did we, every mantle he's placed on us, every anointing, every calling, did we walk in that? None of us did anything perfectly for sure, but did we endeavor to, that we will be able to say, yes, Lord. Yes, I did. Yeah. I, I, and you, we need a mentor to do that mm-hmm. for decades, Janet. I didn't for a long time, I should say, I didn't have a mentor. And I, now I do, I have several women that speak into my life. And let me tell you, when you have a mentor, there is acceleration Mm -hmm. to your ministry because you have someone that will, okay, what's the next step? Okay. Let me encourage you. Let me inspire you. Let me challenge you in this area. Let me give you a perspective change. What do you have in your hands right now? Like, like you're doing, you, you launched this podcast ministry in 2020 during when the pandemic first hit, when many ministers of the gospel were like, Oh, I guess you can't do ministry now. And you pivoted, you, you, you pivoted from your going from church to church and speaking to, I'm going to launch this podcast. Lord, what do I have in my hands right now? Sometimes we can't see it. Yeah. And we need someone to say, well, let me tell you, this is what I see. This is what I see. And Also, a mentor not only will help you see your gifts and talents, but they'll also say things like, you know, I I see there's a ditch ahead. There's a ditch ahead that you could fall into and and you can't see it, but I do. Right. And and you need to know it's there because it will cause you untold pain and wasted time. And let me tell you about the time that I almost or, or, or that I did fall into that ditch and the lessons the Lord taught me how to circumvent ditches. You need someone speaking into your life. So in September of 2021, I launched Trailblazer Mentoring Network. Uh, you can con- you can find out more about it at trailblazermentoring.com. And uh, we do group mentoring via Zoom. 
I now have, I'm now starting one-on-one private mentoring. I have three different levels of mentoring. I have 20 um, e-courses, just me pouring the, the wisdom that God has imparted to me through the good, the bad and the ugly over the years, the decades of ministry, and I've converted them into e-courses. And so and a, a private Facebook group where women of God walk together, whether they're in the ministry for a year or in or 50 years, yeah. that we're all encouraging one another in our particular areas of specialization. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. Well, I'm going to be the first one to sign up for that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love for you to be. <laughs> I really do. And I want to encourage you, you guys, if this is really touching your heart right now and you feel um, the Holy Spirit tugging and pulling on you, now's the time for us to stand together and for women to support one another, all of us to support one another. And I just feel in my heart that there's a lady out there that's listening. They're called, but they're scared. They have a testimony, but they don't know how to present it. They don't know how to say it. They don't. And the enemy keeps saying to them, well, nobody's going to listen to you or your, your voice doesn't matter. Your voice is not important. Um, how, what would you say to that lady? And would you say a prayer for us as we're closing the podcast? I want you to give that lady the one that's struggling with the call, just give her a word. What would you say to her? And then let's just um, say a prayer over all of our listeners and those that are called into ministry, not just called into ministry, but to spread the gospel. You don't have to stand behind a pulpit to spread the gospel. You can spread the gospel. You can spread. That's what revival is. It's yes. spreading the good news and, and telling people about the good news of Jesus and what he can do for us and who he can be for us. So um, we want to pour into your life right now. Um, Jamie, what would you tell that, that, that lady that's listening right now? Yeah, I would, I would tell her, let me walk beside you. Let me help you. Let me hold your hand to take this, a step out of the boat that you're in, that you've been confined, you've allowed uh, people's opinions, your, even, even your own opinion to confine you mm -hmm. into a particular space. And God is like, I want to, I, uh, nations, the nations are God's heartbeat. I mean, if we could hear God's heart beating, it's this nations, 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 yeah. uh, and, and, and it, stop listening to the lies of the enemy, even spoken through well intending people, mm -hmm. uh, stop agreeing uh, with the the things perhaps that you were uh, for years, I, I had to be delivered of shame, Janet, for years, I had a running tape recorder in my mind. No one wants to hear what you have to say. No one wants to hear what you have to say. And see, the opposite was true. Not that I have anything to say. I have nothing to give. Jamie Morgan has nothing to give anyone. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus has a lot to say through me. Yeah. And so stop listening to the lies, stop agreeing with the lies. And one day, and I'm just, this is, this is, this is the truth. We will be giving an account. Yeah. And so let me, let me walk beside you as you're taking a step out of the boat and you're walking on water, keeping your eyes on Jesus the entire time, winning and reaching every single person that you're supposed to. And uh, I just want to encourage you. It, the time is now it's now it is urgent. And so father God, I just lift before you every person, every person listening to this podcast. Father God, I lift up before you all 196 nations of the world and I call forth every woman and man that has a call to ministry, whether it be in the fivefold ministry or whether it be to ministry in their local, in the four walls of their local church, ministry in their backyard, ministry in their, in their uh, development, ministry in, in their county or their state. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare that every person that's listening will rise up, yes. rise up and own, take ownership of the call that you've placed on their lives. That from now on, they will not listen to the voice of the enemy. They will not agree with the enemy. We have nothing to give. It is all Jesus, Jesus doing it through us. And so, Father, I just ask you that you would speak to each of our hearts individually, whatever words we need to hear. I feel like the Lord, for some of you, is speaking to you. You need to empty yourself of you. 
You need to empty yourself of you, your your fears, your this, your that, your opinion, uh, people's opinion of you, and let me fill you to overflowing so that you will be that conduit that I can pour my spirit through, and then you will then pour out to the lost and the hurting everywhere you go. And so, Father, I just ask you, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to identify the purpose and purposes and callings and mantles and anointings that you have on every single man and woman that is listening to this podcast today, God, and that they will say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. We know, Father, that no, no, Lord, is an oxymoron as a believer that we have made you lord of our lives <laughs> saying no lord <laughs> it, it, those words cancel each other out and so lord i just thank you that everyone will say yes lord yes no matter what it means no matter what it takes no matter the criticism no matter what because jesus you are worth it all yeah. and we, i just thank you father god and i praise you that 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 ministries will be birthed Yes. out of this podcast today ministries will oh, be birthed yes. and ministries already in existence will will go to their next level because of this podcast mm -hmm. today because they they receive from you lord encouragement yes. inspiration and they were challenged lord i thank you for that god in jesus name hallelujah hallelujah listen i can feel the holy spirit right now somebody is feeling the tugging on their heart so respond reach out to dr jamie morgan and um, right below you'll see in the show notes i'll have all of her information um, you can email me i would love to hear from you i can connect the both of you i want to hear from you if you feel that call i want you to send me an email um, at janet swanson ministries at gmail.com i want to just hear from you i want to know what god is doing in your life and listen i just I feel this word rising up inside of me. How will they know unless a preacher goes before them? And that word preacher doesn't mean someone standing behind a pulpit. It means someone that is proclaiming the good news. Who will say yes? Who will proclaim the good news? Will you be the first one to say, hey, Lord, I'll say yes. I'll share this good news. I'll tell my story of all that you've done for me everywhere I go until I take my last breath. If that's you, I want you just to get down on your knees right now, lift your hands up to him and say, Lord, I accept this call. I know I'm a woman. I said the same thing. I'm a woman. And maybe there's a man that's saying, I'm, I've been running from the call, but I'm ready to, uh, to surrender now because he is calling us all as a mighty army to stand together so we can win more souls. All right. God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in to One Voice Makes a Difference podcast. I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to One Voice Makes a Difference. It is our prayer that through this episode, God has given you a new hope and inspiration to come out of darkness, break the silence, and tell somebody so His light and healing power may begin working in you. If you would like to connect with Janet, visit her website at janetswanson.org. Finally, if you are currently in crisis, please call the 24-7 Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Don't hesitate. Your voice and your life matters.